This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great platform that makes crypto investing easy. You can buy, sell, trade, and earn cryptocurrencies on Uphold. They have 10 plus million users, over 200 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. I personally use this platform since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. They also offer equities and precious metals that you can invest in. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Ron Hammond of the Blockchain Association. Ron, it's great to have you back on, and I love your background, man. Thanks. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, right now, the, the rotunda on the house side, uh, it's a little hectic, but finally, the Capitol Hill's back open. So I am, as a lobbyist, here all the time, uh, for better or worse. <laughs> so 2023 is here, of course. Everybody's back to work. Um, what are you hearing and seeing? What what's on the agenda for you know maybe Q1 for crypto regulations? So we're seeing a lot of uh, more agency action right now. And I think actually the biggest two things to look at was the Fed statement from January 3rd. It was it was a combination of the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC, uh, pretty much warning. Any banks trying to get into uh, crypto or who are currently trying to bank cr uh, crypto customers or institutional folks in the crypto space, warning them about the multitude of risk when it comes to uh, when it comes to crypto as a whole. We're talking stable coins being uh, depegged. We're talking about bank runs potentially. I mean, it was a pretty aggressive letter. And the White House followed up that statement uh, on the 27th with another policy statement highlighting very, very similar risks and at the same day denying Custodia, which is that bank out in Wyoming that Caitlin Long is running, uh, their application um, to get into the, uh, the Fed payment system. And so we're seeing a pretty hostile uh, regulatory response. Uh, and I think that's going to be happening for a little more longer, unfortunately, just because of the, the fallout of FTX. By no means is this all coordinated. I think this just was a a uh, culmination of everyone saying they were caught off guard by FTX, and these are the actions that are happening to show that they're on top of the ball uh, or trying to cover uh, their, their butt, to, per se. So, at least in Congress, though, they are just starting to form the committees. It's a brand new Congress. They got to reintroduce all these bills. Yeah. Uh, they have to make the committee assignment to see who's going to lead that. So, that's all happening right now. A lot of it's happened on the House side. The Senate should be this week or next week. So, uh, it's a little slow, but we are going to get into crypto uh, very, very soon with hearings uh, starting next month. I guess to your first point, though, uh, all these notices and warnings coming from the White House, I, I can imagine, you know, after last year's debacle with FTX and, and all the crypto companies like Celsius, um, I'm sure folks are on guard now and they want to make sure folks are taking the right steps. But to be clear, they're not uh, saying they're going to ban banks from holding crypto assets they're just saying be careful here are some guardrails is that kind of the gist of it for the most part although we have to say at least from our perspective this is pretty aggressive um we also are wondering is this a policy statement is this a rulemaking is this more guidance uh you know because each three have different uh, implications so if it is a rule there's some major implications there uh, especially for banks that are trying to get into the space um and I think we're going to see that developed in, in terms of what that actual statement is from the White House, because it's very, very important. Um, but at the same time, I think we're going to be seeing uh, still, I think, aggressive posture from the regulators and probably more enforced actions to come. Uh, just to show, again, that they were on top of the ball for FTX. They weren't sleeping at the wheel. Uh, we may disagree that especially the SEC was sleeping at the wheel a little bit, uh, but it is a full out assault um, from the federal regulators. Uh, on the banking front. Again, I'm not saying a ban, um, but especially folks in the banking sector, there seems to be a lot more scrutiny. And I think that's going to develop even further. Yeah. And it's interesting because last year you had BNY Mellon launch crypto custody. They just, you know, didn't approve, excuse me, they disapproved uh, Custodia's uh, request. So there's like an interesting dynamic happening here. And I don't know if it's you know, Custodia is more of a crypto startup bank versus BNY Mellon is America's oldest bank, right? It's an interesting dichotomy. Exactly. I'll also say that there's, not, at least in my experience on the lobbying side, there doesn't seem to be a coalition of sorts of the bank saying, like, we need to screw crypto over, we need to be really aggressive, or we should only uh, have the institutional players like the BNY Mellons taking place. Uh, in the crypto space, as opposed to these uh, more, you know, startup or newer banks, uh, like the Custodia, for example. So I'm not seeing that on the ground right now. 
I think this is, again, more of a response to the FTX situation. And when other banking regulators get involved, there's different elements of the industry that are going to be touched. And right now it's the banks who are just being the heavy focus. Um, so that's unfortunately what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, I would also say Silvergate has gotten a lot of attention on the Hill as well. Uh, we've had letters from Elizabeth Warren, uh, from uh, Representative Mar- Senator Marshall from Kansas, and a few others um, uh, being pretty hostile to Silvergate and, and their role of FTX. You know, what, did they know about the customer uh, commingling of funds, for example? Um, and at least in my sources, it's actually a short seller driving most of these letters and fruity on Capitol Hill for Silvergate in particular. Um, the details, again, are still pretty thin. So it's not it, for folks who are wondering, is it the banks behind this? It seems to be a short seller of some sort, um, but it's weird how some of these players uh, and all these actions are happening at the same time. And folks can maybe think that there's a, a whole coalition here, but that's not the case right now. Hmm. Interesting. And, and that's really insightful that you mentioned, you know, it's some short sellers of so people who are trying to bet against, you know, those those companies and the markets. Uh, and that's just another layer. You know, you mentioned Elizabeth Warren. And there was reports that came out, I think it was reported by Fox, that uh, through a FOIA request, she was sending Chair Gensler questions and answers on a crypto hearing. What are you hearing about that? And how is that being received? So uh, for congressional hearings, I know this is a Hill staffer, um, may not may so personally, but you know, I know many of my friends uh, and colleagues as well. But when you're having a, a, a hearing with a regulator, a lot of times you do want to check in with the agency that you're in, in, uh, asking questions to ahead of time, see, hey, how would the chairman or chairwoman respond? Um, you, candidly, most of these uh, hearings are theater. Uh, you only have five minutes and you want to make the most of your five minutes. And take Elizabeth Warren, for example. Uh, every time that she goes to uh, the Senate Banking Committee and uh, asks a question, it is usually the focus of the media afterwards. So she really wants to use this theater in these five minutes, importantly. And at the same time, we know that her and Chair Gensler uh, have a pretty close relationship uh, and are very, very friendly to each other. And so I think those emails that were leaked um, from the, the FOIA request that came out uh, isn't really anything new we, and shocking. We knew they were coordinating uh, at, at this point. So I don't think it's as much of a controversy. And again, I want to reiterate, at least on Capitol Hill, this is a pretty standard practice. Uh, sure, the words and the framing were being a little, they're a little nice uh, to Chair Gensler, but this is not something that is... Uh, uncommon by any means. Uh, so I, I know Fox is blowing it up, but it's not that it's not as uh, crazy or uh, controversial as folks think. Mm. I, th- I think to the public at large, even myself, it's like, whoa, because we, we don't know about these things and how, you know, the, the dynamic is between these folks. But I think it's revealing like, wow, OK, so they coordinated questions and answers. Interesting. So uh, but to yeah. your point, it I seems mean- like it's a common thing. It is. If you think about like um, industry witnesses or academia, like, you know, again, like I mentioned, these are mostly theater. You, I, before a hearing starts, usually the uh, staffers or the lobbyists or whoever, they're going to pretty much know what each member is going to ask based off, you know, their previous themes or, you know, issues that are important to them. So we always knew that Chair Gensler and Elizabeth Warren were going to have a love fest uh, because they, we knew they were coordinating. Now, this is the proof that shows that. But again, nothing really, uh, you know, illegal or anything that seems n- nefarious. It's it's just something that is to be expected. Uh, but it's good to have proof <laughs> to have yeah. and show folks that. For sure. Um, so speaking of Chair Genser, um, obviously the House is now, a, a, well, I should say, the folks who are part of the House Financial Services Committee, many are in the House. Um, I know there have been talks in my interview with Representative Heisinga plans to bring in Chair Gensler to talk about what's happened last year, FTX, crypto. What are you hearing as far as when that might take place or the first meeting might be? Yeah, it's uh, a combination of trying to figure out when Chair Gensler's schedule is open, because as much as the Republicans want him in, they have to make sure it fits his schedule, because it does take six, seven hours out of your day that he has to black, uh, or, uh, block off. So uh, I think it's be pretty soon, though. Uh, Chair uh, Heisinga, which you, know, you had on your show earlier, you said... Uh, he's been really aggressive when we're chatting with him about trying to bring the SEC in, but not just the SEC, all the other uh, banking regulators. He wants to have them in front of him and have some oversight. Because as I mentioned about the Elizabeth Warren letter, we know, for example, the Democrats want to protect their own. And again, that's not enough on Democrats. That's just how politics works. You want to uh, say, look, I want to defend our team. I think they're doing a good job. But also it, to that point as well, we do have a lot of Democrats who actually who've been pretty critical of Chair Gensler. Um, so we have uh, Senator Hickenlooper from Colorado, 
Richie Torres from New York, uh, who have gone on the record and have sent letters to Chair Gensler, really aggressive about his uh, uh, approach to crypto and being dismissive of it. So that's why it's so important when I see a Democrat go against their own party, because they are so uh, ticked off enough to do that. The Republicans are going to be hammering uh, regardless just because of the, the politics. And I think we're going to have a lot of good questions that we haven't had uh, answered in the past two years. But uh, Chair Gensler uh, is going to be in the committee a lot. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more oversight, a lot more scrutiny. And he's going to have to answer tough questions because they are not going to check in with him ahead of the hearing, uh, you know, how he would respond to a question or to make him look good. They're going to try to make him look as bad as possible. For sure. Um, and is there anything that's coming up for FTX um, as far as additional hearings and how they want to continue to work, uh, you know, in fixing or or not fixing, but addressing some of the issues that took place there? Yeah. Uh, so we are going to see a Senate banking hearing pretty soon. Um, it was announced today in Politico that Chair Brown, the chair of Senate banking from Democrats, uh, announced a hearing on uh, not on, not on FTX, but on crypto generally. Uh, it's still uh, being decided what exactly that's going to look like. But I think, unfortunately, that's the trend we're seeing in the Senate, is that the Senate now has backpedaled a little bit on crypto and said, what is this good for? Is it good for anything? Should this even exist? Do we even need want to regulate it? And that's a really unfortunate position right now that FTX has put the entire industry in because they have called into question now the legitimacy of this industry. And it's a lot harder to lobby the Senate right now than it is um, to talk to folks in the House. We're just a lot more open to having conversations. We have several offices in the Senate who don't even want to have a conversation with crypto industry. They think it's not the time. And so that's it, it's been pretty bad, unfortunately, with the FTX um, situation. But I'd say on the House side, uh, it was announced yesterday, actually, that you'll be having a full committee hearing uh, on, on crypto uh, on March 9th. And that's actually the one-year anniversary of the executive order announcement from the Biden administration. I don't think it's it's time like that. The only way I know is because my birthday is the same day. So a lot of crypto announcements on March 9th, apparently. But at the same time, I think that's going to be the, the, the kickoff here. So we're going to see uh, Patrick McHenry, French Hill from Arkansas especially, really dive deep into these issues uh, and say, like, we need to move forward. We need to get stablecoin legislation done, market regulation, uh, and a few other things. So uh, fingers crossed we can combine those two the Senate view right now, which is not good, versus the House view, which is a lot more positive, proactive, and see if those can uh, formulate together for a bill to get signed into law. Hmm. And I, I, going back to last year, they've always seemed to make, make stablecoin regulation a higher priority, um, given that you know has impact on the dollar and what's going on in the economy and so forth. Uh, do you think once again, this is hard because if we don't know how things are going to pan out and how they're going to work together. That stablecoin regulations are going to come first this year. And could we see it maybe by Q2? You know, stablecoin regulation, I think, actually has got uh, more into the back of the line. Well, it's a very small line, but it looks like market uh, structure is what Patrick McHenry is calling it. He sees that's the next thing. Now, we try to dive into details with him on, you know, media uh, hits or well through like private meetings with, uh, with us or with other groups. He hasn't really given too many specifics, but I think that's why he's trying to keep an open mind. You know, he wants to focus on issues like market manipulation. Uh, he wants to focus on a way to work with the CFTC and SEC. Uh, and that's, I think, going to be a really important endeavor. So that might be taking a little longer just because it's not as flushed out. But stablecoins was where members of Congress gravitated towards because it kind of combined the traditional finance sense with crypto. And so a lot more members were easier to get into it because there's a traditional finance footing. Um, and so it looks like right now, stable coins is probably number two on the list of things to get done. Uh, it can easily skip the line and go number one, but at least right now in this current state in uh, February 1st, it's, uh, it's a second probably or third, uh, for folks to get to in crypto. Um, but again, this is going to mostly happen in the house. Uh, the Senate is going to be a lot more hostile approach. They might work on some legislation. They indicate they want to, uh, but direction wise, they aren't really sure, at least in our conversations. So, Ron, you covered a lot of stuff there. Uh, is there anything else that you're that you want to let us know about? You know, that's maybe coming up. You know, I think we're going to be seeing a little more um, folks focusing on China. It's been a big theme this year. Is China, especially with the House Republicans, they really put a lot of effort into having every single committee, in some way, shape, or form, have topics uh, covering China. And I think most committees are having their first hearing on China, uh, whether it be in energy and commerce, uh, some more on the tech side, financial services, more on the sanctions side, uh, and a whole other host of issues. 
Um, and so a lot of times, actually, uh, this year, in the means I've been in, every single time there's been a China question that's been posed to us. You know, what is blockchain doing uh, in, in regards to combating China? Or what are crypto companies doing uh, when it comes to complying with China's bans? Um, you know, where is there a national security angle for China and crypto? Um, you know, these are questions that we get asked a lot. Uh, and again, mostly from a national security perspective. And so uh, we're telling folks, you know, we'd love to, you know, bring more folks from the industry to come in and tell their story about how they uh, interacted with the Chinese either government or bureaucracy, or also how they were trying to move their uh, business operations because of these bans. And so I think it's a good story to tell um, that for crypto industry that's been through this whole China situation. Uh, but I think that theme is going to be happening for the next two years for certain. And the good thing is that this concern about China is bipartisan. And so we're going to see a, a potentially a way for uh, folks to work together on both sides of the aisle and both chambers to get some good legislation done. So there's always a chance that we can have um, some crypto uh, sentiment intact uh, or tacked on to those bills. But we'll see. Um, but China, big theme this year. Oh, for sure. And I know there's been growing concern of the digital yuan and Look, there's the geo macro geopolitics there, right? With with digital yuan injected into other markets and uh, the reserve currency status, all the that's like yeah, a larger, all that. Yeah, uh, Ron, I know you got to go. Thank you so much. Uh, always great chatting with you, man. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks for having me, and appreciate you dealing with me given the situation. So, thanks again. 